Hello everyone and welcome. This is Learn Hittite and I do hope you're all having a fantastic day. Now, a few months ago, you might remember that I made a YouTube Shorts video about a book that I was really looking forward to, Sub Indo-European Europe, edited by Horst Cronin. And, well, it's finally here and last weekend I had chance to sit down and go through it. What is the book all about? Well, the goal of the book is to examine the dispersal of Indo-European languages across Europe from the third millennium BCE onwards and to explore the nature of the pre-Indo-European landscape during this process. The book looks at how pre-Indo-European languages interacted with and influenced upon the incoming Indo-European tongues, particularly, as the book says, through lexical evidence whilst also throwing some shade and criticism on the past approaches used by researchers to try to understand these types of linguistic encounters. Now, I was pleasantly surprised to learn that the book is available as open access, completely free to download. And that's great news, especially since there are loads of volumes in the series but only a few are open access, so we're pretty lucky here. And actually, a number of the open access volumes, for example, these two here, Writing Systems and Their Use and Valency Over Time, look really worth checking out. And um, uh, to be honest, even this one isn't open access, Trends in South Asian Linguistics. I'd quite like to get my hands on that one too. I'm really happy though that this volume in particular is open access because when I was checking Amazon for the pre-order, they had the hard copy version coming in with a price around the $120 mark. So, you know, it's not exactly cheap, but now you get the choice. You can have a free PDF to do what you want with, or if you want to splash out on a hard copy to feature on your bookshelf, to impress your colleagues or love interest, then you can do that too. And for your money or lack thereof, Sub Indo-European offers 13 chapters divided into five parts. Parts two through to five focus on different geographic zones. So we have Northeastern and Eastern Europe, two chapters. Part three is Western and Central Europe, three chapters. The Mediterranean, part four, with four chapters, and part five comes in Anatolia and the Caucasus with three chapters. It's about 400 pages long, so that's a similar size to Comparative Indo-European Linguistics, an introduction, the second edition, if you need a point of reference. At the back of the book, there's a section with contributor profiles, and it kind of, you know, just details their background and research interests. Some, if not all of the contributors are, are really quite well known. And actually a few of them have featured on this channel before, like Matasovic. Shimon was in the last video on a timeline of the Anatolian languages. And of course, David Stifter, whose work on Old Irish, this book, in fact, was the stimulation for one of my first videos and making that video actually motivated me to produce content more consistently. So all of this, I guess, somehow we can blame on him. But um, yeah, I mean, he's a great researcher, by the way, and he has a, a really well regarded book on Cisalpine Celtic. That's worth checking out if you're interested in that sort of stuff. So yeah, also the back of the book has this um, index of cited forms, which is super useful when it's late at night and you're deep down the research rabbit hole and you need to track back and track down where a particular term was mentioned. This section has got you covered. It's worth noting the editor, Hus Cronin, is no stranger to this field. He's published numerous articles on European prehistory and has contributed to various interdisciplinary studies. 
As expected, the editor provides us the introduction where he invites us to consider what exactly was the linguistic landscape of Europe before the arrival of Indo-European. Was it dominated by a single large language family or a couple of major ones? Or was it more like a patchwork, a mishmash of smaller language family groups, perhaps related in some way to Basque, Etruscan, Minoan or even Sumerian? Or maybe the pre-Indo-European languages were mostly undocumented, unknown tongues. Basically, we don't know. And Cronin notes that answering these questions is going to be far more difficult than it was to reconstruct Proto-Indo-European, for example, with its well-documented descendants, both ancient and modern. He emphasises basically that we need to set realistic expectations for what can be achieved when studying pre- or sub-Indo-European languages. Since direct evidence is likely going to be lacking, we have to look for clues in morphological, phonological and lexical traits of Indo-European languages that might hint at a foreign origin. The rest of the introduction provides an insightful overview of how to identify such foreign elements and the challenges involved. For example, if two neighbouring branches of Indo-European share an unusual feature, it might be tempting to assume that it's a localised foreign trait. However, we need to be certain that this feature wasn't simply lost in other branches before labelling it as foreign. Cronin also warns us against over-interpreting superficial characteristics or relying too heavily on single phonemes, something which tends to happen, or we tend to see quite often, with those ambitious long-range language family proposals that we've covered. Now, I particularly enjoyed the section in the introduction on irregular sound correspondences. And just before that was a bit on non-native morphology. Which excites me a lot because give me a morphological correspondence over a phonological one any day of the week. But what's interesting is that at this point in the introduction, at the beginning of the book, we get introduced to some of the first potential affixes Indo-European maintains that appear to be non-native. Like, for example, as summarised in Table 1, the nasal N suffix. And then a little bit later, we get introduced to the A prefix, this time summarised in Table 2. The idea of non-native affixes making their way into Indo-European languages, whether fossilised or productive, is a recurring theme throughout the book. And speaking of affixes, all the articles which reference affixes in their titles are well worth a read, in my opinion. In fact, I'd actually love to see a whole volume dedicated just to sub-Indo-European affixes. If we go to chapter 5, we have an interesting article by Jornsson, and this article is all about this anna suffix, which appears to be non-native and limited in distribution to bird names. All of the data presented in this chapter, I believe, is original. So that's an, an extra reason to check it out. Uh, and what, what I mean by original is that this is the first time that this suffix has been identified as potentially being pre-Indo-European. Wigman, in chapter 7, writes about how some velar suffixes, some K suffixes, in Indo-European languages may not actually be inherited from Proto-Indo-European, but instead come from a pre-Indo-European substrate. And he offers some examples of irregular correspondences as evidence. Now, what's most interesting in this chapter for me is that Wigman points out that we have to be very careful when we see something that looks like a pre-Indo-European suffix, because it or affix, because it might not be an affix at all. 
we have to be very careful not to impose Indo-European grammar onto sub-Indo-European contexts. Now, this for me is a really fascinating idea and it definitely got me thinking and I would have liked to have seen more space dedicated to that inside this book, but never mind. As expected, Stifter's chapter is top-notch and could stand alone as a, as a great article in and of itself. He examines prehistoric loanwords in Old Irish and he actually builds his analysis from the ground up. So if you're relatively new to Celtic linguistics, you'll still find this accessible. Like many authors in this volume, he is quick to outline the limitations with this kind of research. But basically, Stifter identifies four features of suspected substrate borrowings, including a suffix, and he suggests that the pre-Celtic tongues may have been spoken in Ireland as late as the early Middle Ages. But we have to remember that here pre-Celtic is likely to be whatever variant of Indo-European the Balbica spoke and not necessarily pre-Indo-European. Meester's chapter makes a compelling case against pre-Greek being a single unified language. She argues for there being one substrate which provides terms for flora, fauna, body parts and landscape features, while other substrates supplied more cultural terms. Again, affixes make an appearance here. We've got A prefixation, K prefixation, S mobile amongst others. Now what's interesting about this perspective presented here is that it contrasts with what Beckus suggested in his work on pre-Greek where he leaned towards the idea that pre-Greek was a single language of closely related dialects. Personally I found the section on Anatolia and the Caucasus a bit underwhelming. The three chapters that we get are solid but you know basically I wish there had been more. Take Anatolia for example, we still have many unanswered questions about the pre-Indo-European situation there. I would like to have seen a more comprehensive overview of pre-Indo-European influences on Anatolian languages like Hittite, Lydian, Palaic. All of these languages demonstrate non-Indo-European features usually lexical but sometimes structural like the presence of clitic chains in Hittite or phonological features like the preservation of the laryngeals. The latter two are conventionally attributed to a Hattic substrate but there's actually very little evidence for that. There seems to have been some kind of a real zone where many of these features were shared but again more work needs to be done and I would have liked to have seen some of that here. Shimon, however, does provide a really solid overview of potential substrates shared between Anatolian and other Indo-European branches. And after analysing, I think, 25 proposed terms, the conclusion is that a shared Greek Anatolian substrate seems to be the most promising based on the evidence that we have. Now let's talk about the final chapter in the book, Shriver's chapter, chapter 13. To be honest, it's probably the one I enjoyed the least and the chapter that left me scratching my head the most. At the core of this chapter is a surgical analysis of the various Caucasian terms for camel and their possible proto form. Following on from this, Shriver suggests that the Caucasian languages might have actually been the original source of the term camel rather than the commonly assumed Semitic origin. He follows on by pointing out that the Caucasian form resembles other presumed pre-Indo-European forms found in Indo-European languages. We can see those on screen here with the Caucasian form at the bottom. And what we see here is that if there is an initial vowel present often we see vowel loss or vowel change subsequently in the root. According to Shriver, this hints that these pre-Indo-European forms 
later absorbed into European could have a Caucasian origin. And this is a really intriguing theory. And if we think about some of the proposals that we've looked at concerning really early Indo-European, we often find some kind of connection with the Caucasus, whether it's protopontic or the Caucasian substrate hypothesis or whatever. But in terms of what Shriver has presented here, I am a long way off from being convinced. Shriver's argument hinges, let me get this right, on the presence of an initial vowel in the Caucasian form, while the Semitic equivalent lacks one. Shriver suggests that if this term was indeed borrowed from Semitic, then how did Caucasian gain this initial vowel? Now, in my opinion, it's worth noting that there could be several possible explanations for this, with metathesis being the most likely. And it's also worth noting that Cronin mentions somewhere else in the book that our understanding of the Proto-Caucasian languages is still very, very limited. And while researchers like Shriver and Joanna Nichols have been working on filling this gap, many questions about early Caucasian proto-languages remain unanswered. I think we need a more solid grasp of these proto-languages before drawing conclusions about the significance of an extra initial vowel. And, for example, interestingly, other Afro-Asiatic languages do have an initial vowel in their term for camel, it's just not found in Semitic. So maybe the answer actually lies somewhere there. I don't know. While most of the chapters in the book take a conservative approach to the ideas that they present and put forward, Shriver's doesn't and stands out for being a bit bolder in that regard. But we should also remember that Shriver has published other somewhat speculative articles like on um, Hato Sumerio Minoan, which Shriver sees as being the language family of early European farmers. Now, this may well be true, but just as we see in this chapter, the evidence presented to support that idea tends to be thin. But I'd, I'd like to reiterate that the core analysis here of the Caucasian forms for camel is rather good. It's just about Caucasian and not necessarily Indo-European or even pre-Indo-European. But that's just my opinion. Go and take a read of the chapter and please let me know what you think of it in the comments. I'd really appreciate that. And that more or less brings us to the end of this really quick overview of sub-Indo-European Europe. If you're interested in this kind of content, definitely download the book. You know, even if it's just to help them out with their metrics and to boost their numbers and stuff like that. There is some really thought-provoking stuff there. And if you're even marginally interested in Indo-European, you're bound to find something that you'll like. I don't think you'll be disappointed. For me, this book gets a learn Hittite mark. What should we say? A solid 8 out of 10? Yeah, I'd give it an 8 out of 10. So I'm going to wrap things up here. Thanks for tuning in. Don't forget to like, subscribe, drop a comment to help out with the algorithm. Let's spread the word about this awesome book. And I do hope we will see similar books like this published in the future. Pre-Indo-European is fascinating indeed. You've been fantastic as always. I've been Learn Hittite. Goodbye for now.